The quickest way that God can get my attention is when I lose a sense of His presence. Because I just, I just know I, I got nothing. And not only that, I'm going to make some really bad mistakes when I'm not led by Him and His presence. Welcome to the One Cry Podcast, a nationwide call for spiritual awakening. And now, your hosts, Bill Eliff and Kyle Reno. Well, welcome to the One Cry Podcast. Uh, so glad to have you today. And uh, honestly, Kyle, uh, I, I, I'm amazed that people are uh, able to and willing to just uh, dial into this week <laughs> by week. <laughs> We're and, surprised. <laughs> yeah. yeah and, sure. and, but, but we all, I think there's something inside of us that we yeah. long for revival, we long for awakening, yeah. and we want to know how do we get there. And that's yeah. that's the point of this One Crop Podcast. Yeah. yeah. What is a real move of God and how mm-hmm. do we get ourselves up yeah. to see it really happen in our life, our mm-hmm. church, city, nation, Lord willing, the world. And, and you know, we've been in this series uh, about all prayer, mm-hmm. yeah, like you, you see that that prayer by God's grace is many things, and there's many ways to engage God. Certain ways to pray. There's different kinds of prayers. And uh, mm-hmm. man, last week you got us started on repentant praying. Yeah, and what does it look like to have that real cry of repentance coming out of the core mm-hmm. of who you are? And it was too much to dissect in one podcast. Yeah. So, brother, pick it up and take us to the yeah. finish line here. Well, we we were looking at Psalm 51, and we we saw that uh, repentant praying takes full responsibility. Lord, it's me. Uh, It relies on God's mercy. Oh, Lord, be merciful to me. There's a humility about repentant praying. Uh, It sees the root of our sin. Uh, Lord, this is in me, and, and it's a problem, and I need to go down to the root. And it cries out, for more than just forgiveness, for a clean heart, and for a sustained life of obedience. Lord, sustain me uh, with a willing spirit. Create a steadfast spirit inside of me. And then, and then David goes on in this incredible repentant prayer, and that's all Psalm 51. And by the way, I'd remind you that, that most of the Psalms are prayers and can be prayed just as they are. You can pick them up and, and pray them. But also, uh, the sixth thing I would see about, about this is that repentant praying longs for the return of God's presence. Now, we know in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit would come upon men like David and empower them for service. And this is why David prays in the middle of his repentance, don't cast me away from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. That's an Old Testament prayer, but the sentiment of that is the same in the New Testament and in any repentant prayer. We know that when we come to know Christ, the Spirit comes to live inside of us and never leaves, but we can quench the Spirit. We can grieve the Spirit. We can push Him off the throne, although He does not leave our life and kind of take control again. So, uh, and we lose the conscious awareness of the presence of God and a reliance upon that presence. Well, here's the truth. Everything flows from the presence of the Lord. If you have his presence, you have everything that you need in your home, in your work, in your thinking, in your finances. But if you are not aware of the presence of God and responding and living out of that awareness, you got nothing, nothing that matters, nothing that lasts. You become worried and bothered about so many things like Martha instead of Mary, who chose the good part, sitting in the presence of the Lord with a calm heart, right? So uh, a repentant prayer, I I tell you, the Lord knows how to get my attention. And the quickest way that God can get my attention is when I lose a sense of His presence, because I just I just know I I got nothing. And not only that, I'm going to make some really bad mistakes when I'm not led by Him and His presence. So repentant prayer is desperate for the presence of God, for the return of His fullness. Repentant prayer 
wants that filling of the Holy Spirit, that control of the Holy Spirit in its life again. And it's a mark that we've really come to the depth of repentance that we need to be. Here's a seventh thing about repentant prayer. Repentant praying longs for useful ministry in the future. David came and he said, uh, Deliver me, verse 14, from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation, and then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness, O Lord. Open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. We were made to serve God. And, and our, our lives are empty and fruitless if we're not serving the Lord, if we're not worshiping God, if we're not knowing God and making him known to other people. And if, if I'm in sin, that, that ain't going to happen, right? So a repentant prayer is, Lord, cleanse me, sustain me with a willing spirit, fill me with your Holy Spirit. But then, Lord, if there's any way that I can serve you, use me. Use me, Lord. I want, I want people. You know, the heart I've found of true Christians, not just people who say they're Christians, but true born-again Christians, is they want God to be known. They want the world to hear about Jesus. And how tragic to be unrepentant, even as a Christian, and not seeing that happen through my life. So repentant praying longs for usefulness in ministry in the future. And here's number eight. Uh, Repentant praying is fueled by brokenness. Now, I'm not talking about being crushed. I'm talking about this, this good sense of that word. A broken, contrite man is a man who's come to the end of himself. I was talking to a dear friend of mine who uh, years ago oversaw our divorce care ministry, and and uh, we were talking about whether or not he should uh, uh, enlist the help of a, another guy that he was thinking about. He said, what do you think? And we were talking about it, and uh, and he said, you know, Bill, I just don't know if he's broken. And I said, well, you may be true. He's He's a little full of himself. And he made a statement to me I'll never forget. He looked at me and said, I think the greatest uh, requirement for usefulness is brokenness. And this is why David said uh, in verse 17, you don't delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You're not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So, <laughs> our, our sin, by the mercy of God, plays a useful, heart, a useful part in our development. It, it shows us our need. It shows us the mercy of God. It shows us His grace. And then it, it brings us to that broken and a contrite heart that is so dependent upon uh, the Father. And that's what repentant praying is fueled by that brokenness. And then here's a ninth thing, and I love this. Repentant praying leads to joy. There's something about being forgiven that leads to joy. And that's where the Lord wants to get us. David said, make me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. By the way, he doesn't say the joy of my salvation. He says the joy of your salvation. Mm-hmm. You saving me brings me joy. And you, you think about the day that you came to Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. I guarantee you one thing's true about that day. It was filled with joy. If you really got saved, you, you realize I have been forgiven. I'm on my way to heaven. And it brought you joy. Well, every time we repent, God wants us to go through that same cycle all the way to brokenness. And then ultimately, though, not to this kind of sullen, despondent, woe is me uh, spirit, but uh, a joy and a gratitude for what the Lord has done. One, one final thing I'd mention about repentant praying. Repentant praying leads to corporate revival. 
David in this psalm says at the end of this, verse 18, Now, Lord, by your favor, do good to Zion. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. In other words, Lord, come back to my heart. Come back to our city. Mm. Come back to our nation. And now he's usable again to see that happen. So everything good comes from right. repentance. Right. And, and we ought to be, I think, Kyle, on a, on a daily basis. Right. There ought to be some repentant praying going right. on. Man, I'm, I'm sitting here just listening to you thinking, you know, there's, there's a few things that religion um, uh, can fake. Yeah. But there, there's some things you just can't fake. You mm. can't fake true brokenness. Right. And you can't fake real joy. Yeah. You know, like yeah. when, you, when you get around somebody that's truly broken on their, over their own brokenness, right. <laughs> over the brokenness, the state of things around mm. us, it's just guttural. Yeah. It's so real, right? So real, and the opposite of that's true, you know. Mm-hmm. Which I think there, I think what you said is beautifully true, that that God doesn't just leave us despondent, you know. Right. He He's going to bring us to real joy. That yeah. like I'm, but there's something about me, me and me and God, we're good, mm-hmm. you know. Like it's almost like a relation, a marriage that tries to just keep mm-hmm. going on, even though they haven't dealt with the issue, the, the issue yeah. in their own heart or in their marriage, and. They just keep moving along, but there's not that vibrant. Well, and I think that's why he comes down here and he says, you don't require a sacrifice. You don't want me to bring you flowers. Yeah, right. (laughs) Right. Exactly. You want brokenness, and you will not be displeased. Yeah, wow. This pleases you. Yeah, you don't want just a date night. We're we're good now. Yeah, right. You want to know that I actually feel broken over how I broke your law. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And man, listen— we're all on this journey. Yeah. <laughs> you don't graduate from this until you get home. Yeah. Until you get to heaven. Yeah. And and we always like to stop and hear stories. Uh hear stories of others that are mm-hmm. tracking with these truths. So we're gonna take a moment and do that and we'll come back and pray together. But let's listen right now. So we're back again with Steve Canfield for part two. And Steve, this last time that we shared, uh I just want you to know, as uh, founder of One Cry, my name is Byron Paulus, for those of you that are new to, to the One Cry family. And uh, I just was so moved by the fact that you shared how so many leaders and pastors, full-time Christian workers, lay people, they don't even pray with their wife. And uh, I remember we talked about this uh, offline of a large church, a very well-known pastor. And we just invited during the course of when your team was there, or one of the teams was there, uh, to take a moment and just just pray with your wife. Come to the altar, pray with your wife. And that pastor said, this is the first time I have ever prayed out loud with my wife. And she would hear me in church. Uh, she'd hear me at the dinner table, but just one-on-one. So that probably, unfortunately, is more uh, common than we would like to think. So I want to jump to this session. And Steve, uh, I've heard over and over again over the years of answered prayer, just either you personally or in your family. And I think pastors that are listening, pastors that are watching, I think they would benefit, as would I afresh, of talk to me about your prayer life specifically in your home. Yeah, what are some things that you've made as a practice? Yeah, I think that just in addition to what you said, that the, the, the reality of if you can't pray for the person who knows you the best, it's not that, that prayer is the answer to every marital problem, but it certainly is the baby step to that. Because if you aren't talking to the person who knows you best and can't pray with them, then there's a real issue there. And we, we jump over our personal walk with God, jump over a prayer with our wife, jump over our family, jump over our leadership, jump over our congregation and say, how can we win the world? If we're not keeping all those other priorities, then it's not it's not going to go in place. I made a commitment to Debbie when we got married. We've been married. We're just getting ready to celebrate our 46th anniversary. That I'd pray with her every night and and every day. And and we have, I count on one hand in 46 years the number of days we haven't prayed together. Maybe if I'm was gone for something, but um, and and all that does is it brings us back to um, to neutral, to say, Hey, here's where we're at. You can't, you can't pray and then be fighting with somebody. Um, you know, we made a commitment not to go to bed mad at each other. So we just stay up all night, but no, we, 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 you know, make those things. And so I think uh, we started that we started praying with our kids. 
um, and they're not for the good bed. We pray with them. We would meet um, every year. We'd have on uh, January 1st, we'd make a list of all the things that year that we needed to see. I would like to see God provide. And it was financial things. It was spiritual things. It was lost relatives. And, and then we'd look back every year and I still have it in my Bible where we could see, okay, here's what God has done to see those answers to prayer. Um, we put six kids through college. Um, uh, we're on support. We didn't, and, and we just pray that God provide the means for those things to get taken care of. And they all graduated debt free. Sometimes we would need a vehicle. Sometimes we would need, we prayed for the salvation of some of our relatives and we would continue to do that year after year. Um, and, and, and then we could look and then say, remember, here's what God did. And it, it's going back to seeing our history with God. We've talked about that a lot. Um, my, my confidence in the future leading of God is based partly on my understanding of the history I have with God. Mm -hmm. And I can see how God met our needs financially and uh, has given us everything we have need, provided for what we've needed to do what God's called us to do. And that gives great encouragement for the days ahead. Um, uh, you, you, you touched on a couple of things, Steve, I don't want to race past here. And one is uh, just praying with your wife. Uh, you promised her the day you would get married, that you would pray with her every day. I, I think there was a time when you said, I'm going to tell you, I love you 50 times <laughs> a day. Is that accurate? Yeah. I, we, I sat down after we got married about six months and figured out how many times it would take me every day to tell her I loved her 55, to tell her a million times on her 50th anniversary, which I'm getting close. I divide all the days up as 55 times a day. So for 46 years now, I've told her every day that I love her 55 times. It's usually just for dropping off to sleep. I say, hi, I love you 55 times. But <laughs> that, that, that whole statement has become kind of a term of endearment. Um, and um, just, yeah, I, I need some discipline areas in my life. That's become a, a disciplined area of my life. So consistency is what I'm hearing. And <laughs> so talk just a little bit more about the times you do pray. There's times I'm sure you don't want to even talk to your wife, let alone pray with her. Yeah. Uh, those prayer times might look a little different than the other prayer times. Uh, but just, is it morning? Is it night? Is it spontaneous? It used to be um, every night, which we still do that every night. Last thing we do before we go to bed is, uh, is pray. Now, sometimes she, she, when she hits the pillow, she's gone. So sometimes it's not really uh, um, heard a whole lot. So uh, we started years ago, started once the kids got out of the home, we started doing that in the morning. So we pray for all of our grandkids every morning. We have 20 grandkids. And so we pray for all of our children, grandchildren every morning. And then at night, it's kind of a thank you, Lord, for the day type, you know, whatever. But the um, prayer request time is is in the morning. I try every day to meet with her in prayer. And uh, we're reading through a devotional book together. I, I just know that if I don't um, make that a priority, then if I don't start my day, I start, first of all, with my own personal time with God. Then I meet with her. Um, and and that's that's pretty consistent. That's That's, yeah, that's great. So you travel with about 25 college age young people and you're trying to um, make a part of their DNA prayer. Are there any practical ways you do that with the team members, those college age young people? Uh, how do you grow them up in the, in the discipline of prayer? I think again, part of it is setting aside patterns. Um, somebody says um, ruts are a bad thing, uh, but there, there are righteous ruts. And, and you can you can have good ruts. And so pr if you don't set aside time where you're going to say, okay, here's a time every day we're going to meet and have. So we have a daily prayer time every time before the service where um, they're meeting and they're sharing quests and setting aside. There's, there's something about consistency in prayer that is that is helpful and important for, for most of us because we're pretty, we're pretty undisciplined. I think one of the things I'm learning currently about prayer in the last year that's really helped for me is the statement that prayer is not about an answer. Prayer is about a person. And so I, I don't want to make prayer just about giving God my to-do list, um, but rather I want to, I want to realize that it's about a relationship. And so helping them through the day, understand that it's not that you're going to have this formal time only, but, but it's a relationship that you're going to have. And, and I think, I think the other thing is that I'm learning about this is just a lot of times um, our conversation with God, what, what it, we say, well, God spoke to me or God gave me direction. It's really a, a, a personal relationship where you're walking in, in his peace. And the thing I'm, I'm trying to help the team members help myself is to be able to live in a state of, of peace with God. I remember reading um, Francis Chan was trying to make a decision and he was, he was uh, concerned about, he thought he should do this, but he didn't really have clarity. 
And he said something, he said, I, but I, I realized I had more peace about doing this than about not doing this. And I realized a relationship with God is really him giving us peace. It's not notes out of the sky. I've never heard an audible voice. When I say God spoke to me, I've never heard audible voices, but there's a peace about that. So helping people and team members walk through their day in a, in a spirit of walking in the spirit is really walking in peace that this decision is not should I eat this? Should I get a Coke or a Pepsi? It's 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 the the peace that God gives you as you're living in relationship with Him. So it's more than just specific times. It is specific times, but prayer is really about a relationship, not about an answer. Okay, uh, Steve. I think there are evangelists, there's itinerants, there's revivalists, and invariably there's a message maybe that kind of lasts over the long haul. I mean, I can go back to certain. Uh, evangelists, and you say, man, I remember that message. If, if somebody were asking me, what message of Steve Canfield is a legacy that's going to impact lives for a very long time, I would immediately say the holy hour message. And um, you have trained probably tens of thousands for sure of people on just how to have a holy hour, very practical, and you give them a bookmark or something to remind them. And then what I want to just, maybe you can think about this, and, and maybe I'm putting you on the spot, but I've heard stories of people who would say for the first time, I've spent an hour with God, or I got up this morning at five o'clock because I couldn't wait to pray for the first time in my life. Do you know any stories, I'm sure you do, of people who have been, um, began to practice and that just became maybe a pattern or at least uh, an immediate, uh, yeah. Yeah, every, every meeting we challenge people to do this. It's interesting, the last meeting I did, um, our other speaker got sick. And so I did Holy Hour the first Sunday, which I've never done before. Yeah. And I'm rethinking the value of that because just this is just a few weeks ago, they started, I challenged me for the first, just this week, give God the first hour of your day. And it's a, a little 12 step thing where they spend three to five minutes on each one. And, and just a couple of weeks ago, I heard people stand to give testimony of what God showed them as they were hearing these truths of revival after spending an hour every morning in God's presence. I'm trying to rethink through, is that maybe the better way? To, normally, I do yeah. to the end of the meeting. Yeah. I did right. the very first Sunday. And, and um, most people are just afraid of, of even committing to that because they think, man, I know for me, I, I can think of everything I think of, every person I know in two minutes is gone. How, how, how do you do that? Um, but just having some practical handles and spending a few minutes in praise, a few minutes in thanks, a, a few minutes um, in, 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 in the word of God, letting God speak to you, it's a few minutes, you know, as, as we're um, praying scripture back to him and some of these things. And, and invariably, I have people say, I say, how many of you, um, an hour went by quickly, and, and the majority of hands go up, because it's just, when you set aside a time and give God that priority, mm -hmm. um, it, it's amazing what God will do when you, when you give him time in his presence. So maybe a closing thought or word or Steve, knowing you a quip or something for the pastors that are listening right now, what is it you would want to leave them on your heart for their hearts as we talk about prayer, as we talk about prayer? Well, I think that the thing I said earlier, that, that um, the, the people that are great with God are people that are great in prayer and people that are great in prayer are great in private prayer. And I think that for many pastors, um, prayer becomes preaching. And we get so used to in messages, in services, it's time for prayer. And we got things in our heart, we got a message coming. And so we're, we're talking to God, but really, we're really preaching or re-preaching our message. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the focus has to be, um, this is not me talking to my people, this is me talking to God. And mm -hmm. that's got to that's gotta be an overflow of private prayer. And that's where I think, um, praying in secret. Jesus said, what you do in secret, I'll reward openly. Mm -hmm. And if, if we're not praying in private, it's the same way with praise. And people don't, sometimes the only time people sing is when they come to church service. Mm -hmm. our, our public praise should be overflow of our private praise. Mm -hmm. our, our public prayer should be overflow of our private prayer. Our, our, our public adoration of our wife should be an overflow of our private adoration of our wife. And everything starts behind the doors of our home. And I was just in a meeting um, recently, our last meeting in, in, in Memphis area, and a, a police officer came and gave a testimony. He said, um, the first Sunday you said, what if someone took a camera and followed you around all week and then showed on the screen the highlights of your life? 
And he said, I'm a police officer. I wear a, ca- I wear a camera all the time. Everything I do is recorded. But when I get off the job, I take that camera off. And he said, I thought this week, what if I left the blinds open in my house and, and everybody that could just see everything went on behind my, my, my house? I thought maybe I should do that. I'd live a better life if I did that. My wife might not like it. But, but having that um, glass house life where people can look at every detail of your life and say, I still see the honesty, the reality of Christ behind closed doors as I do in public. And, and that's, that's where we've got to live. And that's where the power is, right? Yeah. And what yeah. we do in secret, God rewards openly. And, and you know this because you sat in pastors' offices all across this nation, brokenhearted, when they open up and share with you what's really going on inside their heart. And now we're seeing it, honestly, on display because of social media and everything else all across this nation of pastors that are getting caught being uncovered instead yeah. of uncovering themselves. And I, I, I couldn't resonate more, Steve, with uh, how that would not be happening if they had a private prayer life. Yeah, that's So, Steve, thanks again. What a blessing. And it is every time I get to hear more stories from you, I call you the great storyteller uh, because there's nothing more exciting because Jesus was a storyteller. Nothing more exciting than hearing the stories of what God does in the hearts of of his children, in the midst of his presence in revival. And uh, I I couldn't help but quickly close here by saying, Steve, wouldn't it be something if pastors all across this nation could get up on Sunday morning and know the majority of their congregation spent an hour every morning that week with the Lord? Can you imagine the responsiveness to the truth as it's shared? And if pastors would begin that, model it, and then uh, the congregants, uh, wow, what a wonderful thing. And I think if they had you, Steve, and your team and taught them the holy hour, that would happen. So all pastors, that's a little plug for the Life Action team. And uh, go to lifeaction.org, right? Right. Right. Steve, thanks. Uh, Bill, Kyle, thank you. What a blessing to do these testimonies. Well, and we always love to hear a good story and, and to honestly have our faith built by others' faith journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as we always do in every podcast, we want to stop and pray it in, yeah. you know, to really say, Lord, me, <laughs> right, yeah. right here before you get to others. So please don't just listen to us pray. Uh, please enter into this prayer with us. Pray where you're driving, listening, sitting right now. And, you know, Kyle, as we begin to pray here, uh, uh it may be you don't need to listen to us. Yeah, right. Maybe you need to repent. Amen. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, what we're going to pray about is not as important about what you need to talk yeah. to about God. So yeah, turn if off. you need to, turn it <laughs> off and yeah. just deal specifically, repentantly, right. and brokenly with the Lord. But let me pray for us, and That's then, right. Kyle, you close. Yeah. Father, uh, mm-hmm. oh, for us. A revival of repentance, mm-hmm. Lord. We we just see so much sin, Lord. I just I just seeing it in the news today about churches, about groups, Lord. Just uh, the sin in all of us, mm-hmm. and then we look in our own heart, and we just see this constant struggle with our own depravity. So, Lord, teach us how to. Pray repentant prayers. Lord, let it be a regular exercise of our life to keep us humble, to keep us grateful, to keep us broken, but then, Lord, to keep us joyful and to keep us useful. Hmm. Yeah, Lord, I, I just, I pray that you would find your people ready to do real business with you. God, ready to have a real conversation. Lord, to agree with you about what you see in us. Lord, to come to those places of confession going, yeah, Lord, I, I, I see those dark corners. I see those motives. God, I see those actions. So God, all of it and all of us, we pray that you would show us what needs to be seen. Right. And then we would repent, God. We would, yeah. we would, we would say, you're right, Lord, and help me now to turn and to walk toward you. So God, I pray 
that repentance would, would lead to real deliverance. God, that you would deliver your people from our brokenness, God. You deliver us from patterns of prayer, God. You, re, you deliver us from habitual sin, God, That's that right. you would free. God, I, I pray that you would set captives free, yes. God, that you would be that great liberator that you are in your church. Uh, Lord, for your glory, God, but also for our joy. <laughs> Lord, for our, there's something so rightly contagious about people that have the joy of your salvation. Yes, that's so, right. Lord, I pray that that would be seen again in your church. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, again, hey, thank you for time uh, that you've given to us here to share these truths. And, man, I would just encourage these last two episodes uh, together about repentance are Uh, Man, the missing ingredients to personal revival and uh, to corporate revival as well. So please pass it on. I mean, mean, send it to a friend right now and just say that, hey, you know what? This spoke to me. I think it'll speak to you. Let's talk about it and and send them to it, like it, whatever you need to do to pass it on. And we look forward to getting back uh, with you next week as we keep learning about all these different ways to pray. See you next week.